Okay. Okay, we, we take a few minutes, no, just 30 seconds to wait for um, more people. Okay, still people coming. Okay. Um, Okay, I think uh we can start now. Um so um why we are waiting for more people. So hi, um good morning, uh good afternoon and good evening wherever you are. Um welcome you all to our Mekong, our Save Webinar series. Um, this time we're gonna focus on liver conservation and COP28 and the low up Mekong levers in combating climate change. And this will be the final webinar under our Mekong, our say series, um, before some of us go to COP28 or go on vacation next month. Um, so you might already be familiar with me. So my name is Palita. I'm the Mekong Program Officer at the Internews Earth Journalism Network. Uh, you can call us shortly EJN, and I will be the moderator today. Um, so before we start, uh, I want to announce that we have Thai and Khmer simultaneous interpretations. Uh, you can switch to these two link language channels um, by clicking at the icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you want to listen in English, you can stay here. Um, okay, um, so now let me take like a few minutes to give you the background of this webinar, um, which many of you might hear about this many times in the previous webinars. Um, so our webinar is part of the EJN One Year Project called Our Mekong, Our Say. Um, it is funded by USAID Mekong for the Future. Um, so our project focuses on building local journalist capacity to report on national resource governance in the lower Mekong region. Um, and we also have some activity that aim to increase public access to information um, relating to national resource management. And this is why we organized the webinar today to provide you update and information about our focusing themes. And Today, our main theme is river and climate resilience. Um, as you may already know that rivers are the lifeblood of people in the lower Mekong region and million people rely on rivers for many things like for drinking water, food, um, transport, or even culture. And river conservation also plays a significant role in um, strengthening climate resilience, um, like preventing drought and, and flood. So um, as the COP28 is approaching in a few weeks ahead, um, I think uh, we think the conversation on the interdependency of rivers, water, and climate change will be emphasized uh, in the water day at COP. And uh, we expect that um, civil society organization and experts in this field may have may call out for actions. So we think we should bring this conversation to you in pre-COP um, period. So you may have some background beforehand and you can like follow up with COP afterward. Um, and yeah, so today we will hear about all of this from three uh, water experts today. Um, so they represent scientists, international organizations, and also indigenous people community. Um, and let me present you to our speakers. Um, and may I ask each of you to introduce themselves, introduce yourself. Um, maybe we can start with Mark, Kathleen, and then Sang So peace. So Mark. Thank you, Barita. Yeah. And thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to take part. My name is Mark Washo. Uh, I'm the lead for fresh water for Asia Pacific, based in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Over. 
Hey, thanks. Uh, so I'm Catherine Cross. Um, I'm the strategy and partnerships lead for the Australian Water Partnership. I'm based in Canberra um, in Australia, um, but previously um, have been uh, living and working in um, Thailand, in Bangkok um, for eight years. Okay. Sanglavi, you are muted. My, uh, my name is uh, Seng. I'm from uh, Upper Cook River and I have been working with the uh, Rumpoti Foundation. Yes, I'm from uh, Cook River Basin Committee. Thank you, thank you, thank you, three of you. So um, we will ask each speaker to go to the presentation for 12 minutes and then we're going to have the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. So if you want to ask anything to the speaker, you can start dropping your question in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of the screen and then we will collect your questions and ask speaker for live answers. Um, okay, that's that I'm done with my part. Um, so um, I think it's time for us to, our speaker. Um, and let be, let's begin with Mark. Um, so Mark, um, you have been uh leading or involving with many research projects uh relevant to fresh water and rivers in the lower Mekong region. So I think you are the best person to talk about the current stage of our rivers and their roles in climate resilience. Um, so yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, and, and happy to, to do this. Uh, first, uh, very grateful to the organizers to call it uh, river uh, and, and, and uh, climate change, not water and climate change, because rivers are much more than just water, although water is obviously an important component of uh, rivers. Uh, the uh, first ever climate adaptation summit that took part in uh, January 2021 only, uh, made it clear to uh, many leaders that uh, uh, climate risk was very much uh, water risks uh, and uh, that uh, the uh, issue of, uh, of uh, water uh, was going to be more central than ever and in, in, in addressing and adapting to the, uh, to the changing world. Um, WF's mission, uh, very much about biodiversity. The key reference document for the WWF is what we call the Living Planet Index that looks at the uh, uh, species, uh, the vertebrate species uh, uh, abundance decline since 1970. If you disaggregate this by biomes, you can see that we are losing species in the rivers and in uh, wetlands much faster than in uh, forests and seas. We are losing freshwater biodiversity twice as fast as uh, uh, terrestrial uh, and, and marine. Uh, so that's uh, frightening to see that number of 84% loss of biodiversity abundance in, in that period. As a result, uh, to uh, uh, this frightening number, we came up with an emergency plan uh, to uh, see what are the root causes and, and what were the actions that uh, that we wanted to take, and it has six points. And the first point is very much about is about keeping free rivers free flowing. And as we realized this and unpack this, we further uh, realized the overlap between the biodiversity mandate and the climate. Uh, mandate. Uh, free flowing rivers, uh, most uh, water resources experts who are in charge usually of uh, river management uh, see the issues as a water quality and a water quantity issue, uh, preserving both, which is very relevant, but maybe not sufficient. Maybe if you do that, if you see uh, rivers as a conduit to bring water as a commodity, you miss many dimensions of rivers and you miss a lot of the equation uh, that you need to take into consideration for climate action. So what we did is we worked with scientists to define a concept of river connectivity or fragmentation, it's contrary, uh, and uh, uh, have this as a scientific reference published in, in uh, and, and scientific journal in Acknowledge, which we succeeded with this, this uh, 
a dose publication that got more than 1,200 um, citations, which makes it a, a solid, a solid scientific base. It, uh, and on that, with that uh, uh, definition, also we mapped the status of free flowing rivers or fragmentation of rivers worldwide, so that we had a, a reference. Red is bad. Red is very fragmented. Blue is good. So uh, not so many blue, especially in in Asia. Uh, that you you can see that uh, Mekong is yellow, uh, and then Mekong has behind the yellow a bit of blue, a bit of red. So it's on the fringe. Yellow means that sediment is even more important than in other rivers. And uh, to my earlier point at the beginning, rivers are not only water. Sediment plays a very important role in the ecology of river, but also in its resilience to climate. So a very important dimension to consider. This was published in 2019, but uh, the work was done in the, in the year before. Uh, I will come back to this, but associated with free flowing rivers, there are values, uh, values that uh, could be cultural, not tangible, but very important to uh, uh, to many stakeholders. Recreational, many people are pay, willing to pay a lot of money to be with rivers. They are values that are understood better also by developers, like uh, by. Uh, uh, people in charge of uh, wider development, like uh, floodplain agriculture, watery food. Agriculture is the biggest user of, of water, but uh, connected floodplains allow to produce more sustainable food. Uh, wild fisheries also associated with free flowing rivers. They are probably the most cost effective way of producing protein. Fish are in a river, they are not constitutive users of the water, but they also. Uh, issues of biodiversity, uh, obviously, as mentioned earlier, but also to the theme, uh, healthy floodplains, connected floodplains, uh, make the river more resilient and the people below, upstream, downstream, more resilient also. Sediment flows also, especially downstream in deltas, helped with the resilience. So again, that frame helped us to identify and, 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 and those, uh, those overlaps. Yes, we published in 2019, the work was done before. Uh, uh, we did a follow-up assessment of the free-flowing status uh, of the, um, of the uh, Mekong with more uh, detail. And, and we've seen that uh, this uh, status of connectivity has degraded a lot since. There's still some blue, but there's more red. And, and, and uh, this means that uh, with the further degradation of the free-flowing river status, we also lose climate resilience. Uh, that was the bad news. The good news is that in the meantime, in those past five years, there's been a lot of publication on the uh, importance uh, of sediment for the river and its importance for, uh, for climate resilience. Uh, I will do a really rapid recap of key dimensions uh, of how sediment affects mainly uh, river uh, depth the uh, incision and how this affects overall the resilience of the river. It affects mainly in the downstream part of the river, the sedimentary part. So that map, that, uh, uh, that image is about Cambodia uh, and uh, the Mekong Delta. You see the turn les up and the lines are, are the rough uh, highlights of the uh, uh, key channels. Uh, if you have riverbed incision, you have less inundation. If you have less inundation, less, as I mentioned, in the benefits, less buffering of the floods, uh, and, and, and that affects uh, uh, flooding downstream and exposure to people to floods. Less groundwater recharge, which affects uh, resilience to dry season. Less, in the specific case of the Mekong, less uh, flooding into the uh, tunnel sap. If there's river incision in Phnom Penh, less water goes to the tunnel sap, which uh, affects the pollution of fisheries, but also doesn't play the tunnel sap cannot play so much its buffer role, so you have higher floods downstream and and uh, not to use uh, You affect the convenience relative convenience of the different channels, which could be an issue for water supply. It increases riverbank erosion, coastal erosion. It affects also very much salt intrusion, so availability also of uh, fresh water uh, for agriculture and and for other human consumption. So if you look at all of this 
uh, it does affect significantly uh, the uh, uh, the ecosystem people who depend on it and actually it, it is really posing an extensive threat to many of those activities and, and, and many of those ecosystems. Uh, that new science somehow, the, what is important also to note is that uh, the coarser sediment has a more important role than the finer sediment, uh, and even if there's less in terms of volume. Uh, with that knowledge and, 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 and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Climate Change Department of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment of Vietnam and uh, uh, AFD, the French Development Agencies, launched this uh, a report uh, at uh, COP27 highlighting, in my, in my understanding, for the first time, the role of sand mining in climate adaptation, which puts all the science into perspective and, and registers there. I think that that's uh, groundbreaking as an understanding of how rivers help with resilience. In the meantime, also, with, with, uh, in, in collaboration with the Vietnam Disaster and Dike Authority, uh, uh, Management Authority, uh, with uh, many partners, technical partners, with uh, support from the German government, we did, uh, for the first time ever, a uh, delta-wide sediment budget, basically looking at how much sand comes into the delta, how much sand is stored, stopped, or moved through the delta, how much is extracted, and how much goes to the sea. And this gives us, for the first time, a management tool that allows to really understand what the state of uh, Sand is, and uh, this result is uh, giving us a pretty alarming understanding of where we are with the stock. Uh, we have much more sand extracted than sand coming in, and uh, if we extracted all the exportable sand left, we would have less than ten years reserve. And doing this would come with very high impacts. Uh, this allows us also to see how strategy sand and height as uh, as Economies are, are dealing with water availability risks and exposure to disasters. Uh, we realize how important sand is and how it relates to the wider agriculture development, uh, energy, hydropower development, and urban development, uh, and, and how it makes it strategic and how important this consideration is to wider economic development. Uh, that uh, that uh, raises the uh, relation and dependency of key economic sectors. So for a long time, we've been looking at the relation to high consuming uh, sectors like agriculture, uh, the dependence and, and how they are affected uh, by by changes in water and availability and 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 and, and, and the changing climate. Uh, we start to realize also that uh, other important sectors for development like construction, textile, electronics, are by this way very much affected also. And that uh, rightfully uh, how the power has been promoted because of its support to economic development, meeting the, uh, meeting the uh, needs for electricity and uh, creating uh, business, uh, but also its uh, performance on the climate mitigation side, which is relevant. It seems in this report highlights a blind spot that uh, the uh, impact of uh, hydro power on uh, adaptation and how it impacts uh, supply chains that are one order or two of magnitude bigger in terms of uh, money flows uh, are, is something that, that is less understood by decision makers. Uh, and seems that uh, it is less uh, also uh, studied and documented. So this report highlights uh, this uh, uh, blind spot, uh, if you want, uh, and uh, it uh, uh, also uh, raises the uh, uh, need somehow to uh, have a more integrated understanding of, of those changes and how it will affect uh, development, but also we may be not asking the right question, but also not having necessarily all the right stakeholders at the table, for instance, uh, of uh, user based in planning uh, uh, from uh, uh, processes. So the Mekong River Commission has its strategy plan, and that's an example of a plan. It's not a bad plan, it's pretty inclusive. There are things that we want, like uh, 
sediment transport, although it is geared to fine sediment, not coal sediment, and I just mentioned how important coal, uh, coal sediment is. Uh, it does also look at uh, economic development, engaging those traditional sectors, like the agricultural sector, but uh, not so much the impacted sectors like uh, electronics uh, and uh, like uh, 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 textile, as I mentioned uh, earlier. But maybe also it needs to highlight more and to take into consideration a lot of the uh, recent uh, development that were high, uh, rec uh, the, the recent uh, understanding that was uh, uh, gathered around the big uh, global events like the climate biodiversity uh, COP or the climate COP, but also the UN uh, uh, water uh, conference uh, uh, that uh, that uh, was geared on, on climate action. So maybe uh, it is uh, time to uh, uh, become a bit, uh, to, to raise our ambition and, and, and maybe we want to uh, uh, understand uh, better how uh, we could uh, uh, link and have uh, somehow uh, a more systemic approach and, 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 and link uh, the, uh, uh, the, the role of the MRC to, to other agendas. Uh, at the uh, uh, UN conference, uh, in, in uh, March, that was again uh, uh, under the auspice of climate uh, action, uh, water action, sorry. Uh, a very important uh, initiative was launched by six governments uh, with uh, uh, support from the key leading conservation agencies working, uh, NGOs working on, uh, uh, on, uh, on water. Uh, and uh, it uh, suggested that we should raise our ambition behind uh, an umbrella uh, uh, initiative that would allow to strengthen the existing frameworks, but also raise our ambition to protect globally uh, 300,000 kilometers of uh, free-flowing rivers and 350 million uh, hectares of, uh, 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 of uh, wetlands. This was very ambitious, uh, and uh, actually, what happened since, if that was uh, uh, somehow uh, registered by the COP twenty eight secretariat, uh, that uh, uh, gave that uh, uh, says that the uh, water should be more prominent in the climate issue, and, and listed that uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, initiatives as one of uh, at their priority uh, uh, action uh, uh, under under the uh, the uh, the uh, under the theme of, of water. Hey, so Mark, time is running out. So can you wrap okay. up? <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, I'm wrapping up. Yes, that that's my last slide. Actually, wrapping up. Thank you for the for the reminder. Yes. So uh, more countries are buying into it. More countries are signing into it. But other uh, other uh, 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 non-Asian countries, it, it's uh, all the other continents that are buying in. And, and uh, I think it's time somehow to uh, recognize that uh, the climate risks and, and the challenges we have uh, uh, mentioned are affecting more people and more relevant to, to Asia. So just flagging that uh, we need more sign off on this. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, it's 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 sad to know that free fall river in the Mexico is kind of a good old day now. <laughs> and yeah, glad to know that um there are also some other initiatives um and strategy that are um ongoing. Um, and then I think we can turn to Kathleen. Um, Kathleen can dive deep more into um the initiative at COP. Um. As part of Australian Water Partnership, uh, her organization and herself actually gonna heavily involved with the Water and Climate Initiative um, at COP28. Uh, so Kathleen, um, the floor is yours now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna I'm going to speak about um, embedding climate resilience in the management of river basins and and link to what's um, happening at the the upcoming UN Climate Change Conference. 
Um, so I'll build a little bit on what Mark has just mentioned. Just really quickly, I'll just give a brief explanation of what the Australian Water Partnership is. So we are a Water for Development initiative um, under the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, was, sorry, was supported by the Australian Department of Foreign, Foreign Affairs and Trade. And we mobilize um, uh, Australian expertise from um, our 250 partners, as well as an expanding network of um, partners from across the Indo-Pacific and international allies, um, such as the World Bank, um, Asian Development Bank and others to um, support climate resilient water management in the region. So our role is to facilitate two-way learning and uh, knowledge exchange between partners. And um, this includes engagement in the Mekong region. Um, we've worked with various countries across the lower Mekong, um, as well as the Mekong River Commission on issues such as um, uh, river basin management and governance, uh, flood and drought management, sustainable hydro power, and fisheries monitoring, among others. Um, so just building from what uh, Mark was saying about um, uh, the climate change conference, um, the imperative to consider water management and use as central to climate adaptation was actually um, came out in the conclusions of the last climate change conference in um, Sharm el Sheikh uh, in last year, COP27. And the COP27 implementation plan um, emphasizes the importance of protecting, conserving, and restoring water and water related ecosystems, including river basins, aquifers, and lakes, and urges parties to further integrate water into adaptation efforts. So, as Mark mentioned, um, this is an opportunity. The, the COP28 presidency um, ha is spotlighting water as a climate issue um, and looking at, at it as part of the climate solution. So with a focus on the three areas, uh, protecting and restoring fresh water ecosystems, urban water resilience and water resilient food systems. Um, so what does this mean? What do, why is how can water be part of the climate solution? Um, and by extension, how does river restoration, along with planning and management across river basins, play a role? Well, Mark um, gave some examples of what that means, um, but I'll just go a little bit more um, from our perspective. So, even when water insecurity is not an issue, we can't assume that there's going to be enough. Um, quality, uh, enough water of appropriate quality and, and sufficient flows to, to meet a, a future needs. Um, and it requires the water sector, which is governments, utilities, resource managers, and water users to have a role in both mitigating climate change um, through emissions reductions, as well as adapting water and river basin management to the effects of climate change. So when climate change modifies surface water availability and quality over space and time, river basin planning and management is an important tool to adapt water um, management use to the new realities, the new um, water availability. So this can be through understanding water availability and use, as well as um, how water is shared um, and allocated, which can be adjusted depending on how much water is available. So, um, effective climate adaptive river basin planning is needs to integrate ecological, economic, social, and cultural aspects, um, and then the expected outcomes um, of a robust river basin planning can help meet diverse human needs, even though there may be changes and uncertainty around the amount of water available recognize and preserve environmental values. So having enough water for the environment to sustain the environmental and ecosystem services that we need. Um, mitigate climate driven disasters. So in, in the context of river basins, uh, sorry, river basins and rivers, this can be um, not just a gray infrastructure, but uh, like meaning built infrastructure like dams, but also um, the importance of investing in green infrastructure like uh, forest catchments, um, river bank restoration and so on. And then finally, um, it can help with facilitating um, transboundary cooperation. 
So um, these are some of the principles um, in a in a paper that we've just developed on climate adaptive river basin planning. So there's four. So first of all, um, there needs to be um, a flexible management of climate driven water supply for long term resource health and to meet that demand. So what does this mean? So this means like have, knowing how much water you have um, and being able to make projections um, under climate change. So this could be through hydrological monitoring and modeling. Um, the second is um, transboundary river basin management um, can enhance climate adaptation through collaboration. So this means shared data and modeling systems. So there's been recently cooperation, for example, between MRC and the Lansan Mekong um, uh, corporate, uh, corporation and um, in, in terms of um, sharing data and um, doing some joint modeling. And then um, Mark mentioned the MRC um, basin plan, but there's also proactive regional planning, which I'll touch on a bit more. Um, adaptive river basin planning can provide a framework for um, implementing um, and resourcing nature-based solutions. So as I just said, this could be like payment, um, investing in your catchment areas and your river basin, your um, watershed areas. So it could be um, downstream users paying upstream users for um, changing their agricultural practices or um, um, not farming certain land. Um, and then um, allocation of water to the environment, which I mentioned before. And then the fourth principle is prioritizing inclusive water governance, which I'll go into a bit more detail, but um, it could be like a legal mandate for stakeholder engagement. So for example, recently, it's not a legally man, legally mandated um, approach, but uh, the MRC had a MR, uh, had a stakeholder forum where, where they you know transparently shared some of the studies and um, upcoming projects that are, are planned for the for the Mekong, and then finally um, in the importance of incorporating traditional um, and traditional and um, local knowledge and perspectives along with scientific data. So. Um, yeah, as, as Mark mentioned, MRC has this um, uh, strategic plan, and as part of it, they're doing this proactive regional planning. So what that means is they're looking um, at how there can be um, cooperation across the region with um, different options for basin countries to consider enhancing their national or joint plans in ways that increase overall benefits and decreases costs. So how they're planning to do that. So first of all, um, they are, um, they have, they're upgrading the decision support framework. So you cannot manage what you don't know. So knowing what is happening in the basin is important. Um, and then they've got a number of strategic studies and you can see that, that for example, there's one on sediment, there's one on understanding the hydrological limits for wetland assets. So this links to very much what Mark was saying about, you know, the importance of sediment, the importance of water for these ecosystems that um, people in the basin rely on. And then there's um, looking at storage options, which are not just dams, but also like green infrastructure as well, which means, you know, the, the river itself, groundwater and so on. And then um, water and energy integration which looks at, you know, there's been a lot of dam construction, but maybe how there can be uh, better use of these assets, like the um, and integrating renewable energy, like floating solar power um, and pump storage hydropower. Um, so Mike also mentioned about um, mitigation. So um, river basin planning can also support climate mitigation. Um, and this is important because a lot of countries have, well, countries have uh, their nationally determined contributions. So they're thinking of ways of um, how to reduce greenhouse gases um, and the actions that are taken um, could, could, could affect available uh, water availability. Um, but there are specific ways in terms of river basin management that can help with mitigation. So Mark mentioned some of them, but there's also um, like how we uh, manage irrigation regimes um, to reduce emissions from some of the, from rice paddies, um, improving water and land management practices to enhance carbon storage, 
and then modifying dams. I mentioned that um, already to provide for multiple services. So not just for electricity, but also water security, irrigation and flood mitigation. Um, I also, I had mentioned earlier about the importance of indigenous and um, indigenous knowledge. So I just wanted to talk about um, that building resilience to climate change at a local level involves using a diversity of information, including community, traditional and indigenous knowledge. So I've been talking at quite a high level, but at the end of the day, what happens in terms of the impacts of climate change are is affecting those that are you know, living in, in the river basin, in the Mekong basin. So it's important to acknowledge and respect um, the not uh, the the um the learnings and generational knowledge that has been passed down. And so there's this concept of two-eyed seeing, um, which is um quoted as leaning to see learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of mainstream knowledges and ways of knowing, and to use both these eyes together for the benefit of all. So that means um, respecting diversity of knowledge. So an example is like using satellite data for early warning combined with um, knowledge on that has been passed down through generations on signs of droughts um, and storms, or in the case of rivers, how changes and flows can affect um, the ecosystems, including fisheries and um, the viability of species. Um, yeah, so I'm nearly at the end. Um, I just wanted to emphasize again the, the importance of um, the, the diverse knowledge um, and how bringing scientific indigenous local practitioners and other forms of knowledge are more effective and sustainable and can help prevent mal maladaptation. And this was um, indicated in the last IPCC report, um, but um, I just have a short clip which can maybe um, articulate it. The thousands of years of lessons from Indigenous people is an undervalued resource. It has the capacity to transform our ability to adapt and develop climate resilient water management strategies. Over these millennia or since time immemorial, we have sustainably managed our lands, waters, wetlands and our natural resources for the health of our countries and our people. We have understood the importance of water and its centrality to life its centrality to our culture. And we have cherished it and managed it accordingly. The world can benefit, not just from in my country, called Australia, from indigenous knowledge, but globally, because we as indigenous people around this world, we talk into cultural mirrors. The thousands of... Sorry. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, that's basically all I wanted to share. Um, just wanted to note that a lot of what I mentioned today comes from this briefing note that we're about to release and um, that we developed with one of our partners. And um, oops, sorry. <laughs> and we have some other resources that um, um, you're welcome to to explore further. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kathleen. Um... Thank you for explaining the interdependency of river and climate change. Uh, it's kind of complex issue, but um, thank you for simplifying it. Um, and thank you for mentioning the um the need to address indigenous people knowledge. Um, but before that, for Kat and Mark, there there are a couple of questions in the Q and A. Maybe you can have a look and think about the answers. Um, I think a few are quite tough one. Um. So um <laughs> so okay uh, let's turn to now to our final speaker um Sang Lowi um so uh Sang Lowi is uh an indigenous people herself and uh she has been working with the community on empowering indigenous people in river conservation effort um and she has been outspoken about the need to include indigenous people voices in development decision um and Sang Lowi will speak in Thai so if you uh want to listen to English translation Please evacuate to Thai channel. Um, our interpreter gonna translate all in English. Um, and for those who who uh, are Thai speaker, you can move to the original channel. Sorry for the confusion. 
so um okay this this thing is your turn uh i will share the screen for you hold on ค่ะขอบคุณค่ะอ่าขอบคุณอ่าอีเจเอ็นนะคะที่ให้โอกาสมาอ่าแชร์ในเรื่องของอ่าภูมิปัญญาพี่น้องชนเผ่าในเวท
ในหลวงราชการที่9และพระบรมสารุวงศ์ก็ยังลงเรือนะคะมา,มาเยี่ยมหมู่บ้านไทยใหญ่แล้วก็หมู่บ้านลาหูทางทางเรือนะคะค่ะ,ะสไลด์ต่อไปนะคะในอดีตนะคะแม่น้ำกกเหมือนเปรียบเสมือนศูนย์กลางของพี่น้องชนเผ่านะคะแล้วก็สำหรับดิฉันนะคะแม่น้ำกกก็อาจจะเหมือนโรงเรียนนะคะที่พี่น้องชนเผ่าได้ใช้เป็นพื้นที่ในการถ่ายทอดความรู้ให้กับเด็กแล้วก็เยาวชนนะคะโดยเฉพาะผู้หญิงนะคะเราจะเรียนรู้ในเรื่องของอริมสองฝั่งกกฝั่งแม่น้ำกกนะคะเราจะได้เรียนรู้จากแม่นะคะว่าเออมันมีพืชชนิดไหนที่กินเป็นอาหารและพืชชนิดไหนที่กินเป็นยานะคะเรียนรู้เรื่องมเมล็ดพันธุ์ต่างๆวันฤดูไหนเราควรจะปลูกพืชผักแบบไหนเพื่อที่จะให้ทําให้เรามีมีพืชมีผักกินตลอดปีนะคะความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างพี่น้องชนเผ่าเองเราก็มีในลักษณะที่แบบเออการข้าวแรกข้าวแรกปลายกตัวยกตัวอย่างเช่นนะคะกลุ่มพี่น้องลาหูเขาจะเก่งเก่งในเรื่องของการหาปลานะคะก็เอาจะเอาปลามาแลกข้าวแลกพริกจากไทยใหญ่เป็นต้นนะคะ,ะในอดีตนะคะความสมบูรณ์ของป่าตามรูปน้ํากกเนี่ยนะคะเราปลูกข้าวปีหนึ่งแต่เราสามารถเก็บข้าวไว้กินได้ถึงสามปีนะคะ okay. ในภาพนะคะจะเห็นว่าในปีหนึ่งเก้าห้าสองแล้วก็ภาพเปรียบเทียบในปัจจุบันนะคะในอดีตเนี่ยหลังจากสงครามโลกครั้งที่สองนะคะป่าได้ป่าทางภาคเหนือเนี่ยได้ถูกสัมปทานในเรื่องของการตัดไม้สักนะคะทำให้พื้นที่ท่าตอนก็เป็นอีกอที่หนึ่งที่ต้นไม้ส่วนใหญ่จะถูกตัดจนเขากลายเป็นเขาหัวล้นนะคะแล้วก็กว่าที่จะฟื้นฟูให้กลับมาเป็นป่าสีเขียวดังเดิมทางอย่างทางด้านขวามือเนี่ยเราก็ใช้เวลาประมาณเป็นเจ็ดสิบปีนะคะกว่าที่เจ็ดทศวรรษกว่าที่จะทําให้ป่าเป็นสีเขียวแบบนี้ได้นะคะเพราะว่ามันเป็นป่าต้นน้ําค่ะในจุบันนะคะป่าแห่งนี้ได้ขึ้นทะเบียนเป็นป่าชุมชนเป็นระยะเวลากว่าสี่สิบปีนะคะที่ชาวบ้านได้มีโอกาสได้ออกกฎระเบียบโดยคณะกรรมาการที่เป็นคนออกกฎระเบียบการใช้ป่าในชุมชนเองเพื่อที่จะให้มั่นใจว่าป่านี้มันจะยั่งยืนแล้วก็จะเป็นต้นน้ำแล้วก็จะเป็นป่าอาหารสำหรับคนที่อยู่ในพื้นที่นี้นะคะคนไทยใหญ่เชื่อว่าน้ำที่มาจากภูเขาเนะคะมันมันจะสะอาดกว่านะคะก็น้ำก็จำเป็นสำหรับชีวิตในการใช้อุปโภคบริโภคสำหรับในชีวิตประจำวันค่ะสไลด์ต่อไปค่ะไทยใหญ่นะคะยังมีพิธีกรรมนะคะที่มีพิธีกรรมมีความเชื่อ,อในเรื่องของการสักการะบูชาป่าและแม่น้ำนะคะเช่นในเรื่องของการลอยอุปคุตนะคะไทยใหญ่เชื่อว่ามีสิ่งศักดิ์สิทธิ์ที่ปกป้องคอยดูแลแม่น้ำอยู่นะคะในแต่ละปีเราจะมีการสร้างเหมือนสร้างบ้านแพรไม้ไผ่นะคะเราจะใส่ข้าวผลไม้ผักเงินและก็สิ่งสิ่งปลูกพืชผักที่เราปลูกจากในสวนต่างๆเอานํามาใส่แพรแล้วก็ลอยแม่น้ําไปเพื่อเป็นสักการะแม่น้ําและขอบคุณสิ่งศักดิ์สิทธิ์ที่ปกป้องแม่น้ําให้เราได้กินได้อุปโภคบริโภคตลอดทั้งปีนะคะนอกจากนี้เราก็ยังมีพิธีกรรมสืบชะตาแม่น้ําการเลี้ยงผีต้นน้ําเป็นต้นค่ะในเรื่องของการจัดการป่านะคะคนไทยใหญ่จะมีการตัดไม้นะคะตัดต้นไม้เพื่อที่จะสร้างความสมดุลให้กับป่ากับคนนะคะยกตัวอย่างเช่นหน่อไม้นะคะเราจะมีการพาถึงฤดูกาลหน้าฝนหน่อไม้เกิดขึ้นมาเนี่ยเราจะต้องตัดหน่อไม้ในรุ่นที่1หรือรุ่นที่และรุ่นที่2นะคะแล้วก็รุ่น3รุ่น4ต่อไปก็ให้มันออกเป็นต้นไม้ต่อไปเพื่อที่จะให้มันเป็นป่าต่อไปนะคะเพราะว่าถ้าไม่ตัดเนี่ยโดยธรรมชาติของหน่อไม้เนี่ยค่ะมันมันจะไต่กันขึ้นไปเรื่อยๆและจะทําให้ต้นไม้มันตายนะคะเพราะฉะนั้นต้องมีการตัดนะคะแล้วก็อีกอันหนึ่งนะคะไผ่เนี่ยยังถือว่าเป็นตัวชี้วัดในความอุดมสมบูรณ์ของป่านะคะ,ะเราจะมีการปลูกปลูกต้นไม้สี่ชั้นนะคะ,ะอย่างเช่นต่อไปอสไลด์ต่อไปนะคะชั้นแรกก็จะเป็นไม้ไคล้น้ําซึ่งจะเป็นไม้ที่สามารถยึดหน้าดินนะคะก็จะถูกปลูกในที่ฝั่งแม่น้ํานะคะเพื่อที่จะให้ยึดหน้าดินเพื่อที่จะให้ดินไม่สไลด์ลงไปในฤดูน้ํา
แล้วก็รากไม้เนี่ยจะเป็นที่อยู่อาศัยของสัตว์น้ําต่างๆนะคะอ่าต้นไม้คล้ายน้ําก็จะเป็นตัวหนึ่งที่อ่าแสดงอ่าความสมบูรณ์ของป่านะคะก็ชั้นที่สองก็จะเป็นไม้ไข้แต่ว่าจะเป็นต้นใหญ่ต่อไปอย่างเช่นดอกสีเหลืองนะคะมันก็จะขึ้นอ่าฝังไปอีกนิดนึงเพื่อที่จะช่วยรักษาความชุ่มชื้นในระดับที่สองค่ะแล้วก็นอกจากนี้นะคะอ่าระดับสามระดับสี่ก็จะเป็นไผ่ที่แตกต่างกันไปจะเป็นไผ่ที่เราเก็บมากินเป็นอาหารแล้วก็จะเป็นไผ่สูงขึ้นไปก็จะเป็นลักษณะต้นไผ่ที่ทำโครงสร้างในสิ่งปลูกสร้างต่างๆนะคะอีกอันหนึ่งก็คือ,อที่จะใช้ทายใหญ่จะใช้เป็นตัวชี้วัดในการความชุ่มชื้นของป่าหรือว่าความเปลี่ยนแปลงของอากาศในแต่ละปีก็คือเรื่องของเห็ดนะคะ,ะชนิดของเห็ดเนี่ยจะทาให้เราทราบว่าปีนั้นอ่ะมันจะความชุ่มชื้นมันมีมากน้อยแค่ไหนเพื่อที่จะให้คนไทยใหญ่เนี่ยได้รู้แล้วก็เตรียมรับมือในเรื่องของการเปลี่ยนแปลงอของภูมิอากาศนะคะอ่ะค่ะแล้วก็อีกอันหนึ่งนะคะอ่าสไลด์ต่อไปค่ะการการเปลี่ยนแปลงนะคะก็ปัจจุบันทําให้อ่าพืชอ่ามเมล็ดพืชพันธุ์หลายชนิดนะคะมันได้สูญหายไปนะคะอันแล้วก็เพราะว่าจากสภาพอากาศที่เปลี่ยนไปอ่าอันนี้ขยายก็มีอ่าต้องปรับตัวค่ะเราต้องปรับตัวแล้วก็เพื่อที่จะให้อ่าสามารถที่จะรับมือกับสิ่งแวดล้อมแล้วก็กับสภาพอากาศที่เปลี่ยนแปลงได้ไปได้ค่ะแล้วแต่ว่าก็ทําให้พืชผักหลายชนิดสูญพันธุ์ไปเนื่องจากไม่สามารถที่จะปลูกเพื่อที่จะเก็บมเมล็ดมเมล็ดพันธุ์ต่อไปอีกได้นะคะค่ะอ่าการเปลี่ยนแปลงสภาพอากาศทั้งหลายที่เกิดขึ้นนะคะมันก็ถ้าเปรียบเทียบมันก็ยังน้อยอถ้าเปรียบเทียบกับโครงการพัฒนาต่างๆที่เกิดขึ้นตามรุ่มน้ำกกนะคะยกตัวอย่างในเช่นในการทำเหมืองทรายนะคะตลอดอสายแม่น้ำกกนะคะเพื่อส่งออกทรายไปใช้ในอุตสาหกรรมในการก่อสร้างในเมืองนะคะก็ทำให้มันเกิดร่องน้ำลึกและก็ตลิ่นพังนะคะ,ะสาหรับคนที่มีทรายที่ดูดออกไปก็ทําให้แม่น้ํามันกว้างขึ้นทุกปีนะคะแล้วก็คนที่มีที่ดินที่อยู่สองฝั่งแม่น้ําก็จะสูญเสียที่ดินที่ทํากินไปนะคะแต่ว่าเนื่องจากว่าทั้งเกือบทั้งหมดของลุ่มน้ำเนี่ยมันจะอยู่ในเขตป่าสงวนแล้วก็ไม่มีเอกสารสิทธิ์นะคะเจ้าของที่ที่ไม่มีสัญชาติไทยก็ไม่กล้าที่จะไปเรียกร้องในเรื่องของการขอค่าชดเชยต่างๆนะคะก็ทําให้วิถีชีวิตของคนรุ่นใหม่ของพี่น้องชนเผ่าเนี่ยก็ต้องดิ้นรนเข้าเมืองเพื่อที่จะหางานเพื่อที่จะเลี้ยงชีพนะคะก็ทําให้พวกเขาเนี่ยไม่สามารถที่จะทําอาชีพประกอบอาชีพเกษตรกรรมต่อไปนะคะเพราะว่าในเรื่องของปัญหาการเสียดินแดนที่ดินนะคะก่อนปีหนึ่งเก้าเก้าสองนะคะในแม่น้ำปกนี่ความสมบูรณ์นี่เราสามารถจับปลาขนาดใหญ่ได้นะคะในตัวขนาด100ถึง130โลนะคะโดยวิธีดั้งเดิมแล้วก็เครื่องมือต่างๆแบบดั้งเดิมนะคะแต่ว่าเพราะว่ามีปลามาจากแม่น้ําโขงแล้วก็เชื่อมถึงแม่น้ํากกในฤดูน้ําหลากอย่างเงี้ยค่ะก็จะมีปลาปลาหลากหลายชนิดมากนะคะแต่ว่าหลังจากที่มีการสร้างเขื่อนป่ายางมนเพื่อผ่านน้ําไปใช้ในเมืองเชียงรายนะคะเขื่อนนี้ก็ได้ตัดวงจรชีวิตของปลาจากแม่น้ําโขงกับแม่น้ํากกนะคะปัจจุบันนะคะปลาก็หายไปเยอะมากแล้วก็มีปลาไม่กี่ชนิดที่ยังเห็นอยู่นะคะแล้วก็ปลาขนาดใหญ่ที่สุดที่จับได้ก็ไม่เคยเกินสิบโลนะคะในรุ่มน้ำกกตอนบนนะคะในในเขตนัดฉานนะคะก็ยังมีเหมืองถ่านหินนะคะที่ได้รับสัมปทาน28ปีในในที่เมืองกกนะคะอันนี้ก็ทําให้เกิดการบังคับย้ายถิ่นฐานของหมู่บ้านทําให้ชาวบ้านในเขตรัชฉานซึ่งส่วนใหญ่เป็นพี่น้องชนเผ่าเนี่ยที่ไม่ได้รับค่าชดเชยแล้วก็ได้รับผลกระทบจากโครงการก็หนีเข้ามาในประเทศไทยเพื่อมาเป็นแรงงานที่ผิดกฎหมายในประเทศไทยนะคะจริงๆในเรื่องของโครงการพัฒนาต่างๆพี่น้องชนเผ่าไม่ได้ต่อต้านเรื่องของการพัฒนานะคะแต่ว่าถ้าให้เรามีส่วนร่วมในกระบวนการวางแผนในเรื่องของการตัดสินใจในทุกระดับแล้วก็โครงการเนี่ยมันควรที่จะมีประโยชน์ต่อพี่น้องชนเผ่าพื้นเมืองด้วยนะคะและโครงการไ
กับโครงการพัฒนาต่างๆที่เข้ามามันก็น่าจะสมดุลแล้วไปด้วยกันได้นะคะก็ยังอยากจะให้มีการปฏิบัติต่อพี่น้องชนเผ่าเหมือนคนนะคะเพราะว่าเราก็มีศักดิ์ศรีความเป็นคนเท่ากันนะคะอันนี้คือสถานการณ์ทั้งหมดของลุ่มน้ำกบที่เราเป็นมีอยู่ณปัจจุบันนะคะขอบคุณค่ะโอเคขอบคุณค่ะนี่อีกนิดนึงนะคะ,ะติดตามข้อมูลข่าวสารเอฟอัปเดตเกี่ยวกับแม่น้ำกบนะคะตามสไลด์สุดท้ายพอดีส่งลิงก์ไว้ให้นะคะของเว็บไซต์นะคะขอบคุณค่ะโอเคค่ะขอบคุณค่ะพี่แสง so um for anyone who are want to Uh, listen in English. You can move back to our original channel. Um, and thank you, thank you, Pisang, um, for reflecting your experience and indigenous people knowledge. And I think that that's clear that why we need to uh engage local community and indigenous people in climate talk and climate policy. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, and there is one question. Um, which is quite a big question. Um, so um. As you know that um our region actually already has a lot of dams, sand mining is everywhere. So if the question for Mark cuts that you know like it seems like we are quite mad madness we have the madness for dam you know. So what can we do now? Like uh you know this disaster already happened. Maybe um Mark and Kat you wanna start and then we can follow by Sang Louis. Sure. I'm happy to provide some some uh, dimension of the answer. Uh, I understand the question is about uh, international mechanisms. So, uh, in in principle, those most of those important import, uh, international mechanisms are uh, work by consensus, and it's difficult to impose uh, something to a government that has sovereign uh, right under the jurisdiction. Uh, the uh, MLC agreement is signed by all. Low Mekong countries now, uh, uh, China is only an uh, observer, uh, and the uh, agreement is not uh, binding. There was a more binding agreement called the UN Water Course Convention. The problem is not all countries have signed. So I think uh, to that answer, uh, I don't think uh, there's an international mechanism that could really impose at, at this stage. Uh, I, I guess the, uh, the response is, uh, Uh, to uh, identify the, uh, the the losers and and winners of 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 this and 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 somehow see the ones that are legitimate and the ones that have influence and try to get them to uh, uh to influence because if there are more losers than than uh, than than people benefiting from from it uh, and not even to mention nature and biodiversity uh, then it is uh, not sustainable uh, and and just then uh, just with many. Players may not be aware that they are losers, or they may not understand it sufficiently. That's part of what we're trying to do to bridge those uh, those gaps and and and, and try to to uh, increase the uh, buy-in and 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 uh, and to those discussions. But that's no. So that's that's the first thought. But uh, Catherine, I'm sure you had something to add. Uh, yeah, I think you probably covered what could be answered. I guess um, just maybe from what you were saying at the start that. Yeah, the issue is that you know countries make these decisions, governments make these decisions. So it's about um, influencing and um, creating awareness, um, providing options, um, improving understanding of what else could be um, developed in terms of like um, energy options, for example, like that's part of what the proactive regional plan is looking at is is looking at different energy options and how wa sorry water and energy options. So not just hydropower, but like how can renewable energy such as solar power and wind power uh, be integrated? And P Fang, do you want to answer? You want me to translate the question into Thai? โอ้ค่ะค่ะพอดีพี่ไม่เห็นคําถามค่ะค่ะคําถามคําถามก็คือว่าตอนนี้คือเราก็มีการสร้างเขื่อนอะไรอย่างนี้ไปเยอะแล้วอะค่ะเขาถามว่าแบบมันจะมีกลไกอะไรที่มันจะทําให้แบบรัฐบาลเขาหยุดการสร้างเขื่อนหรืออะไรอย่างนี้ได้บ้างในมุมของของอินของชนเผ่าอะค่ะ
มีกลไกยังไงให้รัฐบาลหยุดสร้างก็คงต้องล็อบบี้รัฐบาลมันเขื่อนมันเยอะแล้วตอนนี้เยอะเกินความจำเป็นคิดว่าต้องขให้คำนึงถึงในเรื่องของอสิ่งแวดล้อมเยอะๆนะคะเพราะว่าอตอนนี้ป่ามันก็เหลือน้อยลงแล้วแล้วก็ผลกระทบนะ่ะมันไม่ได้กระทบต่อพี่น้องชนเผ่าพื้นเมืองเท่านั้นมันกระทบทั่วโลกนะคะอันนี้เป็นสิ่งที่คิดว่ารัฐบาลต้องกังวลมากกว่าเดิมถ้าหากจะมีโครงการในการพัฒนาขึ้นมาอีกนะคะโอเคโอเค thank you thank you very much um we running out of time so uh, I think that's that's it for our webinar um and I would like to say thank you to everyone to Mark to Kathleen and Sang l o i for being here and for all of you to be with us um and I hope our webinar is useful for you and uh, let's watch out for COP 28 and see how um our government gonna react. Or you know, come up with a commitment, and um, we will share the presentation and webinar record a few days after today. So um, and we also will send you the survey too. So if you have time, please help. Uh, so we can have some more feedback to improve our next events, and and yeah, and thank you, thank you, and um, hope to see you again soon, perhaps next year. So um, yeah, bye bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I leave now then.